Ah, and we are live! Welcome back to Takes by Fans. We got a great show for you today, as always. We are live every single day at noon Eastern. If you want to watch live, head over to twitch.tv slash takesbyfans. If you want to watch but not live, head over to our YouTube channel, Takes by Fans. We post all of our shows and clips of the show there on a daily basis. And if you just want to listen, we are on podcasting apps, Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, iHeartRadio. So however you want to watch or listen, we've got you covered multiple ways. Alrighty, today's a big all Wednesday, man, oh man, one day. We got a little bit more than 24 hours. 24 hours puts us at noon tomorrow. So a couple more hours and full 24-hour day before the start of the NFL season. But I think we can wait a couple more hours um you know until that kicks off so we finally almost made it folks gonna be great cannot wait to kind of talk that game through and break it down a little bit more in depth come tomorrow on the show and then on friday when we can finally break down our first nfl action of the season sheesh it's gonna be great cannot wait for friday show can't wait for tomorrow show can't even wait for today's show uh so today on the show we are going to be guessing and reacting to the week one lines it is becoming more increasingly difficult to stay away from the line actions folks um i have to stay away from the lines every single week until thursday that's kind of when we usually do it thursdays during the nfl schedule or the NFL season, uh, but you know, with the increased betting and everyone getting their own sports book put on an app so you can bet with everybody, it's just everyone is pushing gambling and betting down your throats, which I'm not opposed to. I don't think it's the greatest thing in the world to have it, but you know, I'm not gonna not bet. What are we crazy? <laughs> what are we crazy out here? Um, so it is becoming a little bit more increasingly hard to stay away from the lines and not see the lines. So we are gonna have to kind of move it up to today just because it's getting it's almost getting impossible not to see what these lines are so that's what we're going to do today on the show guessing and reacting to all the week one lines we will make our official picks on friday we will make our official thursday night football pick tomorrow on the show um and we'll go from there and then if we do have time in the show today we will continue on with doing the win totals for all the teams um for all the for the entire season, <laughs> whatever Vegas has that line at, w- which we have been doing for the last couple weeks here. So let's just jump right into it with the stories of the day. And the first one up, well, we had the season finale of Hard Knocks on last night. And woof, this was, I know, you know, the last couple of weeks we've been kind of saying, you know, it was a good episode, but I don't think it was the best episode. But this last episode from last night, I think was the best episode of the entire series. And there was only five episodes, so it's not that hard to do. But still, I think they went out with the bang. I thought it was great. Um, you know, always getting that behind-the-scenes look of, you know, how things go on in NFL locker rooms from the coaches to the players and the owners and the general managers and all that. It's always so great to see in seeing just kind of a nice behind-the-scenes glimpse at that kind of cutting process, narrowing down the final roster from, what is it, 80 to 50? three so or 52 53 whatever it is you know getting a nice glimpse behind the curtain peak look at that was absolutely great and we were able to see that last night on the show so that was great uh so let's go over our notes and what we were saying uh, and what we saw from the final episode of the cowboys hard knocks series so here we go the first note we have up here is the special teams coordinator, John Fassel. He hasn't been getting a lot of play out here, but he's kind of one of the, I, I, I want to say one of the best coaches on this Cowboys team, and he is the special teams coordinator. So he's got great, um, he, he, he was the one that um, had the vasectomy when he was talking to the guys about getting a vasectomy. That was that guy. Uh, he didn't get a lot of burn, like I said, in Hard Knocks, but what I loved from him he, in last night's episode, episode number five, was that he was kind of, he put this kind of thought out there, hey, running is a reward, not a punishment. He was kind of saying, you know, when you do something wrong, we spend you send you on like a sprint, hey, go run a lab, go do some, you know, suicides, whatever it is. But he was like, you know, running shouldn't be a punishment. It should be a reward. And, you know, I, I was kind of buying into that because, you know, when you run, you know, conditioning, nobody loves conditioning. Uh, but, you know, when you run and when you do conditioning, you know, you get better. So the next time you run and condition, you can go a little bit more and a little bit more. You feel better doing it. You don't feel exhausted as early. So you're getting better. And he was kind of, you know, trying to tie that to, you know, being in the NFL and just, you know, every rep getting better and, you know, 
running shouldn't be a punishment. It should be a reward because it's making you better. And it's all about that mindset. Hey, you know, if I, you know, if we go back, you know, 100,000 years and, you know, kind of instill in the, uh, you know, the cavemen, hey, running is actually good. Running is good. It's a positive thing. And then carry out that same thought throughout, you know, the entire history of the entire civilization and up to this point, And we have that same mantra, just be like, hey, hey, running is actually good and it's actually fun you know everybody loves running now because it was instilled into us you know at the beginning of civilization it's naturally programmed into us so that's what I really loved about his kind of final takeaway that we were able to see from him hey running is a reward it's all about a mindset you have to get into this mindset of hey I'm doing this to get better so I am a better player so I can help this team overall so we can achieve our team goal which is winning that Super Bowl so I loved what we heard from John Fassel the special teams coordinator in last night's episode and you know once again one of our narratives going into this kind of training camp season and hard knocks overall since we knew it was the Cowboys was can Mike McCarthy coach do the players buy into him is he saying anything kind of thought-provoking or just something different than boilerplate nonsense to try and get everybody hyped up and we haven't really been seeing that from Mike McCarthy too much but really John Fassel I think he's a little bit of a better coach overall than what we've been seeing from Mike, Car Mike McCarthy I think everybody's kind of everybody kind of buys into him a little bit more um, now with uh, John Fassel, the special teams coordinator, is that he's just that, you know, a special teams coordinator. So you have a little bit more freedom and a little bit more leeway um, as the special teams kind of coach than the head coach that has to oversee everything. So I get it from that standpoint. In special teams, that's kind of where everybody um, that's kind of low on the roster is trying to make the team. So, once again, you can kind of um, mold those minds a little bit more out there since these aren't, you know, Dak Prescott and Ezekiel Elliott, the stars of the team. They're not on special teams. They're not fighting for their position here. So, I just kind of liked what we've been hearing from John Fassel, the short kind of moments that we've been seeing of, of him throughout the entire series and I really think it was just perfect the way the final look that we got to see from John Fassel and what he was saying and you know the players truly being engaged in that session when he was kind of coaching all those special teams guys um, so I absolutely loved that from him thought it was a great just kind of thing to say intriguing running it should be a reward this should not be a punishment it is making us all better so I thought that was pretty solid to say all right, what else do we get here? We got Michael Parsons and Man, oh man, I'm folks. Michael Parsons could be a problem in this league, folks. Like rookie year, like this season, like this Thursday, this man could really set the league on fire. I believe he's got that potential in him uh, um, as a defensive end. So we saw. Michael Parsons learning from DeMarcus Ware, a Cowboys great, a Cowboys legend. And, you know, learning from DeMarcus Ware, I mean, why wouldn't you want to learn from one of the greats? I mean, that was fantastic. And the, the reason why this is such a bigger deal than what it is just on the surface is because when they were talking, Micah Parsons was being 100% vulnerable to DeMarcus Ware. He was kind of telling him, yeah, 100% what's in his mind. He was going through, you know, how he comes off the line. And Micah Parsons ended up saying, you know, every time, you know, my first step instinct is to step here. And DeMarcus Ware was like, yeah, if you step there, you're going to lose your leverage. So you got to have to come out like this. And just Micah Parsons being 100% vulnerable and open. So, DeMarcus Ware, a legend, can kind of critique him and coach him and just be like, no, give him some pointers and be like, hey, try like this and this. If you think you're doing like, if you're doing it like this, you should be doing it like this because of this reason. So, Micah Parsons being 100% open to DeMarcus Ware, that's how you learn and get better. If you can be 100% open... So the other person that you're talking to can know exactly what you're meaning, exactly what you're thinking, exactly how you think, and all that. It's going to make you a better player. So Michael Parsons not holding anything back and learning from one of the greats. I mean, sheesh, watch out. And we already saw him in the first two preseason games, getting a turnover, being around the ball, knowing how to force turnovers and create turnovers. He was doing that already. So learning and getting better from a legend 
Jeez Louise, so watch out for Micah Parsons. Yes, we know he's only a rookie, but he could have a huge impact year one, and I'm looking forward to seeing what Micah Parsons can, can do defensively and how disruptive he can be because, honestly, this Cowboys defense isn't anything special. It's not anything, you know, it's not top tier um, quite yet. It could be. I mean, I like uh, Traquan Diggs, their cornerback. Uh, Michael Parsons, obviously, we've been gushing about him every episode, basically, that we see him in. So, man, oh, man, I hope that Michael Parsons can truly put this Cowboys defense on the map. And, you know, if he's a captain defensively, getting it done, maybe he can help out Dan Quinn a little bit on, you know, the coaching side but uh, and make it a little bit easier for him. But uh, loved what we saw from Michael Parsons in last night's episode. This man could truly be a problem in the league. And, hey, I hope so because to get a Michael Parsons big hit every week to talk about, I'm all about that, all about that. Alrighty, next note up here, um, we got a kind of a nice, solid, not a, not the best inside look. I wish we the whole episode really focused around who they were kind of thinking about keeping and cutting, and uh, you know, Hard Knocks really just kind of focused on three kind of players on the bubble: the offensive lineman from Mexico, Isaac Alicone, uh, the running back Jaquan Hardy, and the defensive edge rusher. Uh, Azur Kamara, Azur Kamara. They really just focused on those three players throughout the entire five episodes, which I, I I don't have a problem with. I wish we got a kind of a broader brush of other players on the bubble, but you know we got a nice inside look at those three players in depth, so I've got no problem with that. Uh, but then they really just focus on those three players during kind of the cutting and you know who are they going to cut and how they are making that decision and all that. So um, I wish it was just a little bit more broad in that aspect. I wish the entire episode was all about just kind of it was uh, Mike McCarthy Jerry Jones and the um, like the, the the general manager I think um, the COO something like that um, all in the room together a couple of other coaches in the room all deciding going through the roster um, everybody on the team and all that selecting their final 53 man roster uh, so Mike McCarthy, and you know, this is another thing that we've kind of said early, earlier, I think we touched on it in episode one, when Mike McCarthy didn't want kind of really Dak practicing early on in training camp because he was coming off that ankle injury, and Mike McCarthy was like, hey, I've seen enough, I know this man can work, this man doesn't even need to practice, and then Jerry Jones comes down on the field and sees kind of, you know, Dak Prescott, this was after the shoulder, uh, shoulder kind of little injury, if we... You should even be calling it that little tweak. Um, and, uh, you know, Mike McCarthy was like, hey, why is Dak not going through the motions? Yeah, he can't throw, but he can still go through the motions. So a little bit of different ideology from the head coach and the general manager. Mike McCarthy's like, hey, Dak doesn't really need to practice because he's the starting quarterback. He knows what to do. We don't want to risk any injury. Where Jerry Jones thought is like, hey, I'm paying this man. I, I need this man to be kind of at the top of his game. He's need He needs to be out here practicing if we're going to be paying him. And if he's going to be our starting quarterback, he needs to be out there practicing every single day even if he can't throw I want him on the field going through the motion so when he can throw when that time comes he can just step right up and you know uh, pick up where he left off throwing the football so once again we we were kind of tracking that different ideology between Mike McCarthy and Jerry Jones trying to look for that throughout all these episodes and I think we kind of found another circumstance or another potential instance here in episode number five and, you know, we all know the kind of um, the narrative, just kind of a mainstream narrative that Jerry Jones um, is very hands on with this Cowboys team, with all the coaches that he's had. And once again, this is why nobody really wants to take the Cowboys job. This is why it's not really a highly sought after position. It's a highly sought after position because it is the Dallas Cowboys. They are kind of the the they are worth the most. They are kind of the richest franchise. Um, so that's why you want to be on this team and head coach it, but you don't because you got Jerry Jones and you're, you're kind of making the final decisions. He's the owner of the team. He's the one that's paying you. Are you know, really going to be like no and stand up to him because nobody's ever done that, so nobody's going to do that, really. So that's what we've been tracking, and we I think I saw a little bit of a 
brief moment in it. And once again, we can only react and say what the camera show us. Couple minute snippets, couple minute clips, 30 second clips, 30 second camera shots of, you know, facial expressions and what they're saying and what they're capturing and what they're showing. That's all. This may not even be 100% true, but this is what we saw from our inside look of Hard Knocks. This is what we saw. This is what we saw the camera and audio capture. So this is what we're saying. So when Mike McCarthy and Jerry Jones were in the room with a couple of other coaches deciding, making their kind of final decisions on cuts, Mike McCarthy was kind of talking about they were going over the quarterbacks. Obviously, you're keeping Dak. I think they were going with... um, I think they said Cooper Rush was a little bit above Gary Gilbert, and then they were kind of talking about deciding what to, what they wanted to do with Ben DiNucci and the general consensus um, with Jerry Jones and kind of the quarterback coaches were like, um, you know, we should pro- we're going to cut Ben DiNucci. And Mike McCarthy's philosophy was like, hey, I don't want to cut you know a second year player that's still buildable, that's still moldable. You know, Mike McCarthy kind of going for bat on keeping Ben DiNucci. Jerry Jones, really not so. And it was just a short kind of glimpse. I don't even know if it was like 30 seconds long, but that was just kind of how it unfolded just really quickly. Mike McCarthy saying, you know, I don't want to cut a second-year player because there is still potential there. I don't want to quit on this guy going into kind of year two. Uh, You know, there still needs to be time to develop and work on him. So Mike McCarthy wants to kind of keep Ben DiNucci and what ends up happening. They do cut Ben DiNucci, but he does end up getting brought back for the practice squad. So, Mike McCarthy kind of got it. I mean, you know, practice squad, you can keep 16 players on your practice squad. So, of I mean, you know, of course, Ben DiNucci is going to be on there, a quarterback. You can never have too many kind of good, solid players backup quarterbacks so they signed him to the practice squad but once again who's making the final decisions here we were remember we kind of said real early on this was before Hard Knock started, started kind of the very first press conference. You know, Jerry Jones getting very teary-eyed and kind of saying he's kind of got, uh, you know, he apologized to... Um, uh, who was it, Jimmy Johnson, about their, their their kind of entire history on what when we're on when Jimmy Johnson was the head coach and Jerry Jones was the owner. He kind of apologized for that. So we were kind of thinking, hey, Jerry Jones finally kind of figured out, hey, maybe I might be the problem. I may be getting in the way and was kind of starting to kind of take a slight step back in kind of that um, helicopter parent role from the owner perspective to the head coach. We were kind of saying, hey, maybe Jerry Jones is finally coming to the realization that hey, maybe I should take a step back and trust the people that I employ here, the the coaches that know how to do their jobs, the general managers and all that. So we were kind of thinking Jerry Jones shedding a tear here to a press conference, saying that he's kind of made a couple of mistakes in the past and now kind of finally correcting his ways. Him saying, I will do anything to win a Super Bowl. We were kind of thinking hey, he's going to take a step back. That's him doing you know anything to win a Super Bowl. Him taking a step back. Him not interfering in the personnel details and how to run the team day to day and leaving that up to the head coach we thought we were getting that from Jerry Jones but then he goes down in the field week one questioning why isn't Dak practicing and then we get kind of him weighing in heavily on the final cuts I mean you know should we should we be taking input from the owners or should it all be coaches decisions if I'm you know if I'm running the team I'm going to employ my coach because I trust my head coach to run this football team to the best of his ability on what he thinks is going to win a ring. I don't know if I, as an owner, get in the way of that or think I have a superior opinion over that. I think I hire my coaches because I believe in my coaches. But it seems like still, Jerry Jones is hiring coaches. He knows he may be able to control and get the final say over, so... Jerry Jones still seems to be like the same old, same old Jerry Jones that we knew after we thought we were going to get a different version of him this season. Nobody changes, it seems, folks. So it was real quick. It was real brief. But I don't know how much of a final say Mike McCarthy had in totality-wise over Jerry Jones. So interesting. 
All right, and then the final thing, we got more great leadership out of Dak, folks. It was a great way to send off Dak in this episode. Great leadership moments from Dak Prescott. Absolutely loved it. They were doing conditioning, and it was only players. I don't think there was any coaches on the field in this kind of conditioning session. It was led by Dak Prescott. How fantastic. Doing conditioning. I forgot what the actual thing is, but it's when you go from, you know, you do it in five yard increments, you go from the five, then you go back, then you go to the 10, then you go back, then you go to, I, I don't know if they were doing, I think they were doing every five yards. Uh, so you go 15 yards, then back, then 20, then back, then 25, and then you keep doing that until, you know, however lo however long part of the field they were using, if they were going the entire 100 yards or whatever it was. But Dak Prescott was leading that session, great vocal leader, a Great breakdown of the huddle at the very end. You know, we're a family. You know, um, one thing that he said, which was fantastic, don't cheat the man next to you. Always touch that line. Once again, that's kind of, you know, that's big. That's big. You're not cheating yourself. And, you know, that goes back to, you know, you know I was doing that. You know, people were saying that in freaking, you know, JV and varsity. You know, don't cheat yourself. Don't cheat the man next to you. Don't cheat this team. Hit that line. Hit every single line. You are not only running for yourself, but you are running for the men next to you. We are a family. We are running for this team. If you cheat and don't touch that line, you're not just cheating yourself. You're cheating the entire team. You are cheating me, your brother, who you're calling your brother this entire last month and a half that we've been at training camp. You are cheating this entire team. So get on your ass, touch that line, and let's have a great fun fucking conditioning session and that's exactly what it seemed to transpire here so transpire over there so great job by Dak Prescott once again we've got no doubts on Dak Prescott we are rock 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 solid on Dak Prescott heading into the season and we absolutely loved what we saw from this man every single episode here in Hard Knocks so Dak Prescott I mean, sheesh, it's so great to watch that leadership come through the television, come through the camera lens, and uh, everybody seems to be buying into Dak Prescott. I don't see one person on this Cowboys team that doesn't really buy into Dak's leadership or thinks it's phony or thinks it's fake or whatever it is. Dak Prescott is truly seeming like the man, folks. So great leadership, once again, by Dak Prescott. And kind of the worst part of practice, conditioning, running, pushing yourself, keep on going in the hot Texas weather, the hot Dallas weather outside in that heat, in the humidity, in the sun blazing down on you. Dak Prescott was still being that leader, vocal as heck, dominant, wanting to kind of be a leader, that voice was heard, um, not, you know, not a little soft voice out there be like, all right, yeah, guys, you ready? You ready for this one? All right, guys. All right, great practice, great conditioning. Very good job, guys. All righty. One, two, three, Cowboys. No, no, he broke it down on Cowboy or Family on three. One, two, three, Family. Everybody breaks, and that's the end of the practice. So very well done by Dak Prescott. Absolutely loved it. Um, so that's that was it. And then, um, you know, they cut a couple of players. They end up bring, bringing um, Isaac Alicone. Um, and Jaquan Hardy back on the practice squad, and Azur Kamara ends up making the actual 53-man roster. So shout out to those players still chasing that dream, and uh, we'll see what Azur Kamara, if he's going to have a big impact to the season. I don't know if about a big impact, but a nice rotational role, and we'll see if we see him on Thursday night. And Isaac Alicone, now that we know kind of that uh, left tackle, left guard, uh, Zach Martin went down, does he get into the mix a little bit more? Do, do they sign him from the practice squad? So that's another potential to kind of watch for this season on how the offensive line works and they bring up Isaac Alicone from the practice squad so overall a great season of hard knocks great behind the scenes looked great that we saw Dak Prescott loved seeing him Ezekiel Elliott shined in this episode as well um so great seeing him and then you know once again just like McCarthy you know we really wanted to see you know, we really wanted to buy into Mike McCarthy here seeing that he is a good head coach and he can coach but really he didn't really impress us throughout this entire series. It's unfortunate. Um, and, you know, I had the same opinion of Mike McCarthy 
coming out of this season of Hard Knocks as I did going into Hard Knocks. Nothing special, nothing great, just kind of boilerplate stuff. Not really coach. I don't really see him coaching up any players, relying on great players. I don't know if he can kind of coach, you know, if he was a head coach for the Lions, I don't think he would have any success. Um, he's just kind of a classic boilerplate head coach out here that can win a couple of games and gets carried by the talent that he has on this team. And we see this a lot on this coaching staff. Ben DiNucci, or not Ben DiNucci. Um, oh, who, I, I, I forgot his name again. How unfortunate. Uh, the ex-head coach of the Giants. Um, Maybe it'll come to me in a second, but let's talk about um, Dan Quinn. Once again, he really only had great success when he was the defensive coordinator for the Legion of Boom in Seattle. Then he takes the head coach for the Falcons and doesn't really do anything. So, once again, not great coaches here on this Cowboys coaching staff. And I would probably say the the coach that impressed me the most here, uh, the defensive uh, defensive line head coach, uh, the defensive line coach was real solid. I liked him. And then uh, the special teams coordinator, John Fassel, real solid coaches out here. But uh, Mike McCarthy, mm, mm, not, the, not a believer, not a buyer into him. So that was hard knocks. Great season. Great episode. Great finale. Episode one, episode five, best episodes. You can say episode five. If, if episode five is the best, I would not disagree. Um, so great season, and um, I need all the uncut footage of Dak Prescott. So if you can give that to me, that'd be great. Hard Knocks and HBO and NFL f films. I will take all the extra footage you have of Dak Prescott. So we will be in touch, so I can acquire that. But uh, anyway, great, great season of Hard Knocks. All righty, <clears throat> let's keep going here. We get uh, the Saints going after another cornerback. We just saw them sign um, Desmond Trufant. We went over him yesterday. Nothing special. Um, and now they go out in trade for... Texans cornerback Bradley Roby. So a newly acquired cornerback here for the Saints in the last two days, shoring up their defense, trying to shore that up as quickly as possibly, as quickly as possible before the start of the season. And we'll see how it plays out. But let's see what Bradley Roby is doing here at profile uh, playerprofiler.com and seeing if Bradley Roby has what it takes to shut down the best wide receivers in this league. So Bradley Roby, 29. Nine, five foot 11 inches all righty uh played a couple of games last season he played uh how many games we get uh, 10 games he started okay so here we go against Tyreek Hill week one five of five for 30 38 yards that's not bad overall yes you gave up 100 percent catch percentage but only 38 yards on five catches for Tyreek Hill who we know can takes the top can take the top off the defense I mean you really can't play Tyreek Hill that tight because he can get behind you quick and if he does it's seven points for the other team so that's not bad that's a pretty solid lockup there by Tyreek Hill all right then against Marquise Brown of the Ravens four of four for 45 yards all righty Against Chase Claypool, 0 of 5 for 0 yards. That's a lockup on Chase Claypool. Gosh dang, that's fantastic. Against Adam Thielen, 7 of 9 for 96 yards. That's a big old burn. Against DJ Chark, 5 of 9 for 43 yards. A great lockup. Against AJ Brown of the Titans, 6 of 9 for 76 yards. A little bit of a burn there. Against Devontae Adams, 0 of 0 for only 0 yards. Rashad Higgins, 3 of 6 for 20 yards. Great lockup. Against Amir Bird of the Patriots, 5 of 8 for 68 yards. A little bit of a burn. And then the last opponent, he went against Marvin Jones of the Lions, 0 of 3 for 0 yards. So, overall, he faced great wide receivers last season on that Texans team. And we know the Texans aren't the best team last season. Only won 4 games. But he was a little bit of a bright spot defensively. Locking up Tyreek Hill. Going against Marquise Brown, Chase Claypool, Adam Thielen, DJ Chark, A.J. Brown, Devontae Adams, Rashad Higgins. I mean, that's a 
decent kind of gauntlet to run for an entire season. So br really kind of solid work there by, by Bradley Roby last season at the cornerback position. The Saints go out and get him, and we'll see if he can kind of shore up this cornerback defense here for the Saints heading into week one. So I would probably say this is a real solid pickup at the cornerback position. What are the Texans looking like defensively that they think that they can feel so good about letting this man go because he was a solid kind of corner last season for them. So let's go to the Texans depth chart quickly um, to see what they've got working at corner. If this is kind of a, a, a pick that kind of signifies the Texans are just kind of throwing away the season or if they truly feel they have good cornerback depth out here. So here we go. The Texans corners now are Terrence Mitchell and Desmond King. What do we got with these players? Terrence Mitchell. Three forced fumbles, no interceptions. He did have 13 pass defenses. That's real solid. Let's go to him very quickly. We're not going to spend too much time on these other corners here, but I do want to see what Terrence Mitchell is doing against these good wide receivers that we have in this league. Terrence Mitchell. We got him up. Am I spelling his name wrong? Terrace. Nope, that's Terrace Marshall. Terrence Mitchell. All right. Let's see if we can spell his name right this time and get him up. There we go. Okay. Terrence Mitchell. All right. 5'11", 29. I mean, 29 years old, 5'11", same exact kind of um, uh, build as um, uh, Roby. Bradley Roby. All right. But here we go. Terrence Mitchell from last season against A.J. Green, 3 of 10 for 36 yards. That's a good lockup. Jeez. Against Amari Cooper, 13 of 15 for 159 yards. Jeez, that's a burn. Against James Washington of the Steelers, 5 of 8 for 120 yards. That's a big old burn. Against A.J. Green, round 2, 4 of 5 for 49 yards. Against Will Fuller, 5 of 6 for 34 yards. Against A.J. Brown, 5 of 8 for 99 yards. That's a that's a burn. Uh, against Sterling Shepard, 1 of 3 for 10 yards. That's solid. Against Marquise Brown, 3 of 5 for 63 yards. Against Brashad Perryman, 2 of 5 for 14 yards. Against Deontay Johnson of the Steelers, 2 of 6 for 69 yards. So, yeah, he's kind of getting burned. And these are kind of Tier 2 wide receivers he's getting burned by. A couple of uh, Tier 1s. You know, Amari Cooper, Tier 1 wide receiver, blowing right by him. James Washington's not even a Tier 1. He's a Tier 2, solid Tier 2, but gave up 120 yards. So, all right, I don't know if I'm the biggest buyer into Terrence Mitchell. And then their other corner, Desmond King. Let's see what he's got going on here. Zero interceptions, only two pass defenses, no forced fumbles. Jeez Louise, I don't know about this, dude. All right, let's see what Desmond King's got up here. Desmond King, here we go. 26 years old, so younger, only 5'10 still. All righty, wish he was a little taller out here. But here we go. Desmond King last season against John Ross, 0 of 1 for zero yards allowed. Against Tyreek Hill, 1 of 1 for only two yards. That's not bad. Um... Against Keelan Cole, 3 of 5 for 36 yards. That's a pretty solid lockup. Against Zach Poshkel, 7 of 7 for 80 yards. Jeez, jeez. Against Willie Sneed, 2 of 4 for 14 yards. Zach Poshkel, round 2, 2 of 5 for 42 yards. Not terrible. Against Jarvis Landry, 2 of 2 for 24 yards. That's a good lockup right there. Against Keelan Cole, round 2, 5 of 8 for 41 yards. So getting better the second time they kind of face him. That's not bad. Not bad, kind of the same. Um, and then Kiki QT, 3 of 4 for 16 yards. Alan Lazard, 2 of 2 for 28 yards. So he wasn't really facing any Tier 1s. Solid Tier 2s sprinkled out here throughout last season, and he made the most of it. So not bad by Desmond King, but I don't, I'm not too big on Terrence Mitchell. So the Texans are trusting their other corners besides Bradley Roby, and they ship him off to the Saints. So we'll see how he does here for New Orleans, and we'll see how this – Saints defense is week one is this kind of a, a a panic they're like oh my god we truly have nothing here we have to get stuff right before week one uh, maybe they aren't really up to speed week one but week two they can settle in so we'll see what the Saints defense is looking like come week one all right, and before we move off of the Saints, I mean, what the hell is going on here? I don't understand this release at all. I really don't like this, and I actually hate this, and I actually kind of dis I, I don't respect the Saints for making this move. 
So, the Saints released running back Latavius Murray. What the heck? Latavius Murray will become a free agent after refusing to take a pay cut from the Saints. So, Latavius Murray refuses to take a pay cut and you cut him like five days before the season starts? What the hell is that all about? Latavius Murray is a real solid running back out here. He's 6'3", 230, a great frame for a running back out here. Now, he's never really been the number one running back on a team. Uh, he's been in the league for seven years, going into his, eight, his eighth season. Only has 1,000-yard rushing season, but that was because he was the main man in Oakland in 2015, so he was able to rush for 1,000 yards. Then he goes to Minnesota in 2017, 18, and 19. 2017, that was the year before, uh, where they got Dalvin Cook, so they didn't really use him too much as a rookie. And he still rushed for 842 yards, so he was kind of the main man there. Still solid production, 842. Then in 2018, he starts splitting carries with Dalvin Cook. That's why he can't kind of get back to 1,000 yards. And then he goes to the Saints the last two seasons where they have, where they have Alvin Kamara, so he's not going to be the number one running back, obviously. But the last two seasons... Playing with the Saints behind Alvin Kamara, who we all know is their A1 Tier 1 option out there. He's still rushing for 600 yards both season. Fantastic. And catching another kind of 235, 176. He's not, you know, a dual threat like Alvin Kamara, but he's a real solid option out here at running back and a real great backup at best. I think he can still be kind of a number one on a team somewhere. But uh, the Saints let him go because he isn't willing to take a pay cut. He's not willing to take a pay cut so you can keep signing all these other corners to shore up your defense. Sorry that, you know, the general manager and the owner and the coach, whoever's making the final decisions on how much money these players are getting, that's not Latavius Murray's fault that they can't balance their books um, well and that they, you know, overspent on some other pieces and their defense is lacking. That's not on Latavius Murray, but you decide to cut him because he's not going to take a pay cut? Jeez, this this early this this um this late into kind of the the training camp now that we're really into week one now, you're going to cut him like five days, not even five days. We got Thursday, Friday, Saturday, yeah, four or five days, however you want to count it, before the start of the season and you cut this man? Disrespect. Disrespect is hack. So, we'll see what Latavius Murray hopefully he can find a team Quickly, I don't want to see this man not on a team. He's too good to not be on a team. Miami, oh my God, could you talk about the Falcons? Please, this is a blessing for the Falcons. Go and get this man an edge on his shoulder for a division opponent. Oh, yes, get that. And we know this Falcons team doesn't have any great rushers. We just saw, well, we're going to talk about it in a second, that uh, the Ravens ended up signing Le'Veon Bell, so now their running game is good. But we're still, we still want to see this Falcons team with the really great running back for for Arthur Smith to utilize coming off of Derrick Henry for the Titans the last two seasons. So we want this Falcons offense to be complete from the corners to the tight ends, to the wide receivers, to the running backs. And we just had that missing running back. I would take Latavius Murray if I was the Falcons. Get this man up to speed as quick as possible so he could be. I'm taking Latavius Murray over Mike Davis any day of the week. No, no contest, no, dis no debate, no discussion. So, we'll see where Latavius Murray ends up. I really hope he ends up somewhere before the season starts. Get this man on a roster, folks. Come on. Damn it. Really did not like seeing this from the Saints. Truly a great running back. A great number two option. Maybe one of the best number two options in the league, folks. That's how high I am on Latavius Murray. So, we'll see where he goes. But he ends up getting cut by the Saints. Jeez. Alrighty, and here we go. The Ravens are signing Le'Veon Bell, and this was the perfect decision. We just talked about this yesterday on the show. We thought this was a no-risk freaking moon reward. This reward could pay off as high as the moon is, folks. We're talking about moon potential here. Moon potential. There's no other running back that would give you moon potential, and that's what we were saying. The potential is too high for the Ravens not to sign Le'Veon Bell in the risk. There is no risk because you were forced to sign a running back. It's not like they were like, okay, we have J.K. Dobbins, and he's looking good, but we're going to take the risk on Le'Veon Bell. J.K. Dobbins, we appreciate you. You're still young. You can still get your time, but Le'Veon Bell, he's a little bit of an expiring running back out here, getting older in age, so we have to get him while we can, and we're going to use him. 
That's not what the Ravens situation was. It was J.K. Dobbins got injured. Their second string or their third string got injured. We have to rely on Gus Edwards, which we do feel comfortable with, but we've got no number two out here. And Gus Edwards is not a kind of workhorse running back uh, that can take every single snap and be productive. That's not what Gus Edwards is. So... We, we are, our hand is forced. We have our cream of the crop. Nobody's really taking free agent running backs, and there's good plenty of them. We talk about them all the time. Uh, Lamar Miller, Le'Veon Bell, Adrian Peterson. Um, I think Frank Gore is still out there, and um, Alfred Morris, and now we got Latavius Murray. I mean, there is great running back depth out here in free agency if you need to shore up a number two, a number three, whatever it is. So the Ravens do actually go out and sign Le'Veon Bell. We saw him. Um, kind of in the building yesterday. That's kind of w what prompted us to talk about it, and they do get the deal done. So that's fantastic. Huge, huge, huge moon, Saturn, Jupiter, Pluto. That's not even a planet anymore. That's the potential we're talking about because we know what Le'Veon Bell can do. Let's go over his stats, folks, just in case you forgot what this man is all about, folks. Take your guess at how many 1,000-yard rushing seasons he has. I'm going to guess five at minimum. Let's see what this man's all about. Here we go. Uh, he played how many seasons with the Steelers? One, two, three, four, five seasons with the Steelers, and he has three 1,000-yard rushing seasons. He didn't do it in 2015 because of an injury, only started six games, and he didn't do it his rookie year because he only played 13 games, still got up to 860 yards, but uh, 1,300 yards in 2014, 1,200 rushing yards in 2016, 1,200 rushing yards in 2017. Oh, and did you forget he's kind of a dual threat running back out of the backfield? 854 yards receiving, 24. 600 yards receiving 2016, 600 yards receiving 2017. So grand total stats, uh, yards, folks. He had a combined run and receiving yards of 2,200 in 2014, 1,800 in 2016, 1,900 in 2017. And then his first year with the Jets, who's apt, I mean, folks, that Jets team was trash. He was still able to accumulate 1,200 yards through the air and on the ground. So this is what this man can bring to the table. No other free agent can do this. Adrian Peterson could potentially do it all on the ground, but can he do it in his older age out here? I don't know. So, Le'Veon Bell, an absolutely extraordinary, no hesitation signing here by the Ravens, and we'll see how it pays off. I wouldn't expect to see this man big week one, but watch out for week two. He may not even play week one. I wouldn't put that, you know, uh, you know, uh, against the Ravens. I wouldn't put that past the Ravens of not playing this man week one. Maybe not ready. Maybe not kind of in football shape. We don't know what he's been doing. We haven't really seen any workout videos of Le'Veon Bell saying, hey, I'm, I'm ready to go. We actually heard nothing from Le'Veon Bell, which is kind of weird right because of how how great this man was in his prime in Pittsburgh truly unfortunate that he fell off so hard um but um you know the Ravens take a chance on him this is there is no risk there is no risk if he's literally ruining the locker room you can get rid of him whenever you want because I'm sure they didn't pay that much for him and you know this is a forced hand pick forced hand pick so I think it's going to work out brilliant. I think it's going to work out brilliant, and I think the Falcons are going to be kind of kicking themselves because we wanted to see the Falcons go out and get this man, and uh, now the Ravens end up signing him, claiming him, and he is a Raven. It will wear the purple this season. All righty. Um, let's keep going here in this story. All right. All right. I'm about it. If you're going to, you know, talk your talk and, you know, get ready for the big action. I've got no problems with you saying it, but if you're going to put that out there and say it, you better, you better show it or we're going to kind of not clown you. We'll clown you respectively. Um, like we said, we do, uh, we talk about everything. Yes. You know, we knock players and get down on some players and clown some players of all sometimes, but it's all out of respect because you're putting yourself out there. Uh, because you know, we we expect the best out of everybody. You know, it is out of respect. So, Browns rookie linebacker Jeremiah Uwusu Koromoa says he's ready to face Travis Kelsey in the, in, uh, for the Chiefs in the season opener. Now, we are big believers in Jeremiah Uwusu Koromoa. We do, I believe we have him. On our number one, yep, he's our number one linebacker on our big board. And once again, we are going to be referencing our big board kind of decently throughout the season. This is how we 
figured all of the drafts, draftees from the season would kind of just be fall in order as their careers progressed. And we have Jeremiah Wusukormoa looking the best to us out of all the linebackers. Uh, uh, out of Zayvon Collins and Micah Parsons and Jabril Cox and Nick, Nick Bolton. I may have been wrong on the Micah Parsons because we've been absolutely loving what we've been seeing out of him and Hard Knocks. But we haven't been able to see Jeremiah Wusukormoa, so that's still yet to be decided. But, um, you know, to be ready and to be... Ready to go to face Travis Kelsey, tight end university, the best tight end in the league coming into the season. We'll see if that changes this season, but um, it's a tall task, and he says he's ready for it. So let's see what he's saying. Let's see if he says how he's preparing for it and how he ha he's going to handle the matchup and how much respect. He better say he respects Travis Kelsey. I don't want to see anybody disrespecting Travis Kelsey out here because he's so gosh dang good. So here we go. When Jeremiah Uwusu-Koromoa began sliding toward the back half of the 2021 NFL Draft, Cleveland swooped in to stop his fall. The Browns already had a plan how to employ the do-it-all linebacker. The rookie will get to test that plan right off the bat in Week 1 when the Browns face Kansas City in its boatload of weapons, including tight end Travis Kelsey. Quote here by uh, Kormoa says, I'm definitely ready. All righty, love that. Love that. He's ready to go, knows what he's going to be going up against, and uh, hopefully has done his due diligence on how to stop this man um, as this week kind of has been going on. Owning the size, speed, and coverage ability, the Browns view uh, Koromoa as someone who can help slow pass-catching tight end Travis Kelsey, who ripped the Browns for 108 yards and a touchdown on eight receptions in Cleveland's postseason loss to the Kansas City Chiefs. The Browns hope the rookie linebacker can provide at least a bit more resistance for the all-pro tight end. Yeah, yeah, 108 yards, Travis Kelsey, folks, in a playoff game. You better give this man all the respect, all the respect, and Koromoa. Moa, if you say you're ready, you better mean it because 108 yards, that's a big old burn, especially in a playoff game. You cannot give Travis Kelsey that. So hopefully he's up for the task. We get uh, one more quote, two more quote, potential three, four more quotes here by Cormoa. Hopefully they're more substance than, hey, I'm ready. All right, here we go. Another quote by Cormoa says, quote, a high rated guy. It's not foreign to me to have some type of matchup. As such, watched a lot of film and had to watch a lot of film to be able to be ready for a guy who is at who is as talented as him. We'll be ready. I will be ready as a team. We are looking forward to game planning correctly. So, Koromoa watching the film on Travis Kelsey. Unfortunately, he's a linebacker, so he wasn't able to get into tight end university to learn firsthand. I wonder if some, if I'm a kind of a, uh, a a linebacker in this league, I may kind of say, "Hey, I'm switching positions and try to get into that tight end university next season to kind of get all the inside information." Be like, "Oh, okay. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. This is how you stop it. Okay. Yeah. Taking all the notes, observing, watching. Um, so <laughs> we'll see if Gormoa can get into there um, next season." All right, we get one more quote, so let's read the lead up here. Jeremiah uh, Owusu Koromoa offseason hasn't been seamless. He tested positive for COVID 19, and a gash on his head that required stitches kept him out of several practices in the club's final preseason game. However, the rookie said that even though he missed on field time, the mental reps will help him get off to a fast start, saying, quote, Same ordeal when I was on that COVID quarantine. Same thing. Doing everything that I can that's off the field. I, am, I was still doing some individual drills too still running and doing things like that making sure I keep my stamina up it wasn't as big a setback as it may seem will be good so Cormoa making no excuses the COVID my head gash the stitches I got I don't care yes I missed some practices but I was still doing mental reps I was still watching the film on Travis Kelsey and that's you know you gotta learn from the film seeing what they do so when you see it you know what they're gonna do oh he's stepping inside I know after he steps inside he kind of angles off on that other foot so I can cut it off maybe jump around 
route. I know that this route goes with this play. So maybe, um, okay, the coverage. I know that Travis Kelsey is going to curl right back. That's not my guy. I got kind of a middle zone out here. And I know with Travis Kelsey on this comeback route that there's two receivers coming slanting across the field. So if I could be in that midpoint, I could break it up because he watched that film. So Jeremiah Wusukoromoa, he's ready for the smoke come week one against the Chiefs, against the uh, Travis Kelsey out there at the tight end position and we'll see how well he does he's going to be starting out here for the Browns he, hopefully he there's no rookie dust rookie rust on this man that he can go and get it done so Kormoa hey we wish you the best out there we wish you could cover Travis Kelsey these tight ends are getting a little bit big big head out here no they started their own university for god goodness sake they started their own summit so because they deserve they feel they need more recognition and more pay and we're going to talk about a tight end getting paid in a second but uh jeremiah will score more knock that block off uh deflate that big head that they've all been having Go do it week one. Set the tempo. Being like linebackers are better than tight ends and linebacker university is going to be the next flag that's behind us come next season. Go get it done, young fella. We'll be watching and we'll be rooting and we'll be breaking it down if you do it on a Monday's show. All righty. Let's hear from Josh Allen. Oh, big week one matchup. This may be the best. I got the week one schedule right here. Man, Cowboys Bucks is obviously going to be great. Um, but Steelers Bills, I mean, this really has the potential to be the best game of the week. Browns Chiefs is going to be great as well. Bears Rams could be good. Ravens Raiders could be good. But, I mean, we've got, you know, two juggernauts in the AFC going at each other week one. And it's unfortunate that one of these teams is going to start 0-1. I mean, both of these teams had the potential to go, you know, big undefeated, like 10-0, 11-0, 12-0. A potential, I would say there is potential, um, not great odds. I would not bet this. I would not take any action on this. But I would say there is potential that both the Steelers and the Bills or the Bills could have gone undefeated this season if they did not face each other week one. So truly, truly unfortunate that one of these teams is going to have an 0-1 record next to their name. There would I'm just going to say now, do not panic. If you are the Bills or the Steelers fans, you root for them, whatever it is, do not panic if your team loses this game. You're kind of supposed to, you know, lose this game. It's supposed to be a dogfight. This is a huge opponent that you should be gearing up for, you know, come playoff time. So use whatever they do here and use it for your next meeting that you will face in the playoffs because both of these teams are playoff caliber teams. So let's see what Josh Allen is saying ahead of week one. So Josh Allen compares Bill Steelers game to boxing matches saying quote taking a couple hits here and there giving them out so he's anticipating this is going to be a dog fight Josh Allen we're expecting big things out of uh, him this season and really nothing that has shown us otherwise which is absolutely fantastic but uh, Josh Allen he's been a little bit quiet I mean we haven't really heard any Josh Allen which I don't know if it's a good thing or a bad thing but we saw him in preseason game number three and we didn't even care that we didn't hear from him because he's picking up exactly where he left off in uh, you know, throwing that ball, slinging it around like he does. So let's see what he says here on this matchup week one. So here we go. Despite changes in the opponent, Bills quarterback Josh Allen knows he's in for a fist fight come Sunday afternoon saying, quote, we know that it's going to be a tight game. Last couple of years, obviously, they've been kind of boxing matches, taking a couple of hits here and there, giving them out. They're extremely well coached. They're a very talented group on defense. They got a Hall of Fame quarterback, Ben Roethlisberger, over there. So we got to be on top of our game and go out there and try to execute to the best of our ability so love hearing that praising the other team not saying hey this is an easy game we'll win this one for sure knows this is a great team knows it's going to be a dog fight knows they have a great defense knows they are very well coached and they're going to be sound in their fundamentals defensively and it's not going to be that easy to kind of you know have them bite on a pump fake or have them kind of bite on an off look anything like that that they are going to be very very sound fundamentally on the defensive end of the ball all right, we got some more quotes here. We got two more quotes, so let's start reading some lead-ups here. 
Allen is 2-0 in his career versus Pittsburgh. Last year, the Bills won 26-15 in Week 14 in Buffalo. In 2019, Allen's team toppled Big Ben's less Steelers squad 17-10. In week 15 in Pittsburgh. Previous to that, the Steelers had won six straight matchups from 2001 to 2016. Quote here by Josh Allen says, quote, we know they're going to bring it. Game one, and they were extremely good last year, and they're going to be extremely good this year. We know that. Again, we got to go out there and execute. And then one last quote here, so let's read the lead up. One player in the Steelers' defense that Allen has no question about is Minka Fitzpatrick. He knows about him in Miami, whom the quarterback faced against Miami before Fitzpatrick moved to Pittsburgh. Yeah, NFL, we can write too. We know that. We know that. Hire us. We'll write your articles. We can write them for you. We're already doing that. Uh, but here we go. Last quote here by Josh Allen. He's one of those guys that can wreck a game plan. We got to figure it out and figure it out early come game time. It's always fun playing against guys with that type of caliber and putting yourself against the test. Oh, Josh Allen wants to smoke. Oh, we love that. Not shying away. No, they have Big Ben, you know, Hall of Famer. He just called them. Knows they have Mike Tomlin going to be coaching up their guys very well. No, they have Micah Fitzpatrick and says, hey, it's always fun. It's always fun playing against those guys, putting yourself against that test. Josh Allen, we have big faith in him, loving what he's saying out here, respecting his opponent, and then going to go out there and just have his play do the talking. Um, so Josh Allen versus the Steelers. Josh Allen, Big Ben, probably the last time in Big Ben's career that this is ever going to happen. Facing against Josh Allen, they're kind of the same ask as Pittsburgh, Bills, Buffalo, kind of blue-collar towns. Uh, Josh Allen, Big Ben Roethlisberger, kind of blue-collar quarterbacks out here. So this is probably the last instance we're going to get. Maybe we'll get it in the playoffs. Hopefully we get it in the playoffs. Could you imagine an AFC championship game? Kind of, you know, old guard and new guard passing the torch. Big Ben and Josh Allen. I mean, kind of the same ask of quarterback play and style and all of that. So it's going to be a great one come week one. I really don't even know who I want to win this game. We're going to be uh, predicting and reacting to this game's line a little bit later in the show. I'm probably just going to call it Bills minus three because of the home field advantage. That is it. And uh, we'll see what it is. But it's going to be a great uh, – I think the Bills are at home. Uh, do we have that? What do I got? Um, Steelers at Bills. Yep. So, Bills at home. We'll see who goes out and gets the win. But it's going to be a great game. All right. <clears throat> Let's talk about this. We're not going to go in depth in this. I just want to touch on it lightly because just once again, how great this Bucks team can be offensively. So we know they have great weapons, but a weapon that wasn't really used last year because of once again injuries. And this is, you know, his history here, unfortunately. But uh, OJ Howard, tight end, folks, they have three great tight ends. I mean, we we talk about running back by committee having three great running backs, but no real team has three great tight ends. Rob Gronkowski, Cameron Brait, O.J. Howard, and why O.J. Howard isn't just a bigger name than he is, uh, just because of the injuries. A little bit underperforming because of the injuries. He's a big old 6'6 tight end heading into his fifth season here, but he's been injured two years. 2018, he only started eight games because of the injury, and then last year, 2020, he only started one game, played in four because of the injury. But when he's not injured, real solid out here. Year one, 432 yards, and then in 2019, when he played 14 games, 459 yards. So obviously we want to see that be up a little bit more, but because of, you know, the great tight ends that he has on this team already, he doesn't have to kind of be a thousand yard receiving tight end because you've got two other great and great other tight ends to help you out in the rhythm and all that and just the depth and all of that. So, O.J. Howard has the chance to be absolutely magnificent. Great tall option here for Tom Brady. And Tom Brady says, O.J. Howard, Bucks tight end O.J. Howard, quote, prepare to have a great season. So, once again, all the weapons everywhere. The three great tight ends, and they're just getting better. Tom Brady's feeling better after the surgery, feeling better 
everybody's healthy. Antonio Brown's going to play from week one for the entire year. O.J. Howard can hopefully stay healthy, and they're going to be having three great tight ends on that depth chart. So come Thursday, it's just unfortunate. I want to see the Cowboys have success this season because of Dak Prescott, but I just can't see them winning week one. This Bucks team is just, I mean, when you talk about star-studded team, I think this is the best roster ever assembled. I think this is the best roster ever assembled in NFL history, folks. I mean, this is something wild. Once again, Tom Brady just outlier. This is an outlier team. All of these players should not be on the same team together. It should not be. This should be illegal. But yet, here we are, Tom Brady somehow figuring out a way to be an outlier, uh, you know, writing unwritten rules out here, or unwriting unwritten unwritten rules, whatever you want to call it. It's this man breaking every boundary, breaking every hypothetical rule, hypothetical kind of good stat that we kind of put emphasis on. He throws it right out the window. And he does it again with all the great personnel. So watch out for O.J. Howard. If he could stay healthy... That's a 6'6 maniac running down the field. We'll see if you can stop it. So, jeez, jeez. Oh, man, oh, man. Cowboys, I feel sorry. I wouldn't wish, I wouldn't wish facing the Bucks on my worst enemy, folks, at all. I don't, I don't want to see anybody face this Bucks team. They're so gosh dang good, folks. So, watch out, watch out. All right. We get this on Justin Herbert, and this is why I have Justin Herbert highly ranked so high, folks. I know, I know. I have Justin Herbert ranked number two quarterbacks overall in the entire league. Patrick Mahomes, one. Justin Herbert, two. Josh Allen, three. Aaron Rodgers, four. Russell Wilson, five. So, I understand. I am a big believer in Justin Herbert, but it's not for no reason, folks. And it has partly to do with this stat right here. So, here we go. In 2020, last season, his rookie year. Chargers quarterback Justin Herbert had eight games with 300 plus passing yards an NFL record for a rookie quarterback doing things he broke like two or three rookie records from last season uh, the touchdown record set by a rookie that I think Baker Mayfield previously held he broke that and then this one right here passing games of 300 plus yards he had eight of those things folks with three more if he has three more 300 passing yard games this season, Herbert would pass Patrick Mahomes and Dan Marino for the most such games of 300 plus passing yards in a player's first two seasons. So he only has to throw three 300 yard passing games to break a record that is previously held by Patrick Mahomes and Dan Marino. I mean, folks, 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 we know Dan Marino's great, unfortunately never won a Ring, but Patrick Mahomes is great, and he's won a ring, and been to two Super Bowls. So, I mean, folks, 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 who cares that Tom Brady's been in the league 20 years, and, you know, Justin Herbert's only been in the league for one year. They could still be great passers in their own regard, and I think Justin Herbert's going to have an absolutely immaculate season. I'm calling 5,000 yards for this man. I'm calling potentially best quarterback in this league by this man, and I'm expecting big old things from Justin Herbert, and we have him highly ranked, and we're not going to, you know, not rank him highly just because, oh, well, he's only year one or year two going into year two. I don't care. I saw what he did year one. It looked fantastic. It looked like he wasn't a rookie. So I'm not going to hold you back because you're young. If you're getting it out, if you're going out and balling, we're going to praise you. Year one, year two, year three, year 20. We don't care. I'm not going to, you know, use your resume against you or for you in a in one season. I'm not going to do that. I'll do that, you know, at the end of your career or when we're just comparing uh, career-wise. But for right now, I think Justin Herbert could be potentially the best passer in the league. Yeah. So... I've got no problems, and I don't think I'll be switching Justin Herbert from number two before the season starts. I think we may just kind of quickly update that list um, come maybe Friday or Saturday or even tomorrow whenever we get to it. A lot of other things I want to do before that. But, um, yeah, I mean, I'm not going to apologize for um, putting Justin Herbert number two. And I just had somebody uh, post a, a comment on one of our videos where we were praising Josh Allen, and he was like, did I just read that right? Do you have... 
Justin Herbert, number two over Josh Allen? Ridiculous. I'm not going to apologize. We'll see this season, and uh, he will show you all this season. Justin Herbert will be fine, folks. He will be more than five. He will be extraordinary, extraordinary, terrific, magnificent, um, whatever you want to use. That's what Justin Herbert's going to be. So Herb out here getting it done, and we're going to see him get it done this year too. All right, and talking about tight ends, folks, hey, they're starting to kind of get what they wanted. That was kind of what their kind of goal was to start tight end university, more recognition. We pass where we catch like wide receivers. We throw our body. We sacrifice our body over the middle of the field like wide receivers do, and we have to get our hands dirty by blocking like tight ends or um, like uh, like offensive linemen, and we just want to be compensated for that. And it's starting to potentially happen here, folks. The Ravens and Pro Bowl tight end Mark Andrews have agreed to terms on a substantial extension with Andrews getting a four-year, four-year deal worth $56 million, the $14 million average per year means he'll make more money through four years than any other tight end in the league so we just had Kyle Pitts shatter the barrier of highest drafted tight end which you know comes along with the highest paid tight end because of the money at that number four spot and now we have Mark Andrews another tight end getting the most money uh, uh, average per year for a tight end so they're getting they are seeming to already you know, get what they wanted to accomplish there by starting tight end university, and they didn't even have to play a game yet. So we applaud Travis Kelsey, George Kittle, uh, for you know doing what is necessary to not only further your money, but to further everybody else's money that's coming up as a tight end, paving the way, if you will. So once again, while you have to respect the hell out of Travis Kelsey and George Kittle, they're great tight ends, so you got to respect them for that. They seem like great guys, great people. I don't see them kind of being, you know, any, you know, bad social media word like racist, homophobic, anything like that. They just seem like genuine, great people, great people to be around. And now they're paving the way for the young kids that are growing up that want to play the tight end position and also still want to get money and get recognized and, you know, kind of be in the consideration of great players in the league on a year to year basis. And that's what they're doing here. Mark Andrews, $56 million deal that is the most average per year at $14 million. So. Shout out to Mark Andrews for getting the deal. Shout out to his agent for getting it done. Shout out to Tight End University for helping it get it done. And uh, hopefully Mark Andrews can continue to rise and make the tight ends, um, you know, worth it. And, you know, hopefully this isn't a bad deal where everyone's looking at this deal and be like, hey, we just finally paid y'all and y'all want to flounder. So, yeah, we're not going to pay you. So a little bit of pressure on Mark Andrews to get it done this season. We don't think he's not going to get it done. We think he rises to the occasion. So well done by Mark Andrews. All right, and then the last thing to talk about here, well, Derrick Henry's high school stats have emerged, folks, and man, oh, man. Before we get to the stats, we have this picture of him in high school, and can we just, uh, can we, this is the next canvas. I'm going to be straight up with y'all right now. Next season, this is the canvas. It's Derrick Henry's high school picture where he's just absolutely hulkish over everybody near him this is this is a grown man folks do you see this right here this dude right here he's a grown man and he is shorter he is um less broad he is less beefier than derrick henry this man a high schooler 17 16 18 whenever this picture was taken he is a mammoth specimen as kind of a kid you're still kind of a little bit of a kid at 17 18 and this is a kid standing next to two grown men who he's absolutely towering over, folks. Man, oh man, this thing was getting this this man was getting it done in high school. And we have the picture and we have the stats to go along with it. And brace yourself, folks, because could you imagine you being a high school team and you having you Lee High School on your schedule, knowing you're going to have to go against a grown man when you are not even a grown man? How are you going to prepare to tackle this dude? If I'm a high schooler and I have to look at this man, I'm like, that's not that's not real. They, they got a grown man. This, this, ref, somebody... 
Can you check his birth certificate, please? This man does not belong on the same field as me. A little low high school. I'm only a junior. I'm only a junior linebacker. And you want me to go against this dude? This brick wall right in front of me? Coach, uh, coach, I need, to, I need to sit out. I don't, I don't want to be out there. You're telling me how? I, I got to see one person. I got to try and find some Derrick Henry high school highlights. Maybe I'll try to do that for tomorrow's show. But I got to see some guy trying, some kid try to tackle this dude. I got, I'm going to see if I can bring it up quickly uh very very quickly i don't really want to spend really any time on this because we have no time in the show to go over really anything i mean we are running out of time folks uh, but uh derrick henry i want to see if i can find anything in high school because i just got to see the attempts of tackling this man um where are these high school highlights okay here we go I just want to see somebody try to tackle this dude. Can we talk about what this? Can you? Oh my goodness, folks! Oh my, folks! He just he just delivered this blow to number eight here. Uh, look at this defender. This defender is trying to gear up to tackle Derrick Henry, and Derrick Henry just lowers his shoulder and powers right through this dude. How can you stop him? Can we just talk about the height? Just look at this man compared to everybody else on the field. I mean. Nobody's even close to this man's size at all. Oh, my God. Here we go again. Direct snap. They got this man taking direct snaps. Oh, my God. He Look at this dude. He spent five seconds behind the line of scrimmage trying to find a way to run, and now he's breaking it for 80 yards for the touchdown. He's going all the way. I mean, geez, Louise, how? You you have to just call in this game. If you're facing Yu Lee High School, you just have to accept the loss. You're losing the game. Look at this. This is eight people trying to bring him down. Eight people trying to bring him down. Here we go. Let's count them. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Nine people can't bring this man down. Oh, my God. There's three more. Four. And then he's off to the races. 50 yards. 50 yards clean. Nobody can catch up to this man. What the hell? What the hell is this? How is this? Well, he did go to Alabama. So, I guess, you know, Nick Saban was doing his recruiting. And, and he's passing? Did he just throw that ball? Oh, my God. They got this man direct snap out of the backfield and then throwing a 45-yard bomb down the field. That was actually very, very well thrown. Holy cow. That was fantastic. He's back to the running game out here. Once again, just reversing field. This is this is nonsense, folks. I mean, this is literally comic. This is comedy right here. He can literally do whatever he wants. He can spend 10 yards down the backfield, 20 seconds in the backfield, finding a way to open up a hole, run all the way to the left sideline, then reverse field 15 yards behind the line of scrimmage, run all the way to the right sideline, and then take it up field for the entire rest of the way, like he did right, like he did right here, just right up the middle. I mean, geez, Louise. Oh man. So yeah, Derrick Henry was a problem in high school <laughs> if the video isn't gonna say it we're definitely gonna tell you what the set what the stats are and once again number four is not even trying to tackle this dude <laughs> he's just trying to make it not seem like he's not trying to tackle him um and there's just nothing you can do there is nothing you can do the size the speed the strength the length it's all there oh man this is a long day for all these opposing teams guys <laughs> Gosh dang, so that's Derrick Henry in high school, folks. And now let's get the official yards up here because they're just as impressive. So here we go, four years in high school. A grand total of 12,000 yards. He put up 2,000 yards in his first three years, and then he said, oh, senior season? Oh, yeah, let me go get it. And he doubled his yards, 4,000 yards his senior year on 462 attempts, folks. I mean, he was averaging 30 rushes a game, folks. 30 rushes a game. Fantastic. For 12,000 yards, he was averaging 8 Point seven yards a carry for his entire career. 8.7 yards. Yeah, no wonder why they had him lined up in the freaking shotgun. No wonder why he was getting direct snaps. 8.7 yards a gain. I mean, folks, that's never punting the ball. You never have to punt the ball. How crazy is that? He averaged 9.2 yards his, uh, his senior year. He also averaged 
327 yards a game. A game, folks, his senior year. Oh, my God. And he put up 55 touchdowns. He put up 55 touchdowns this senior year. He put up 153 touchdowns throughout his entire career. So, man, oh, man, Derrick Henry, Derrick mother loving Henry. I love this dude so much. Uh, best running back in the league, hands down. And I think he's going to end his career as the greatest running back of all time. That's what we have expected expectations wise on this dude and we hopefully definitely see him break the single season rushing record this season and hopefully just freaking keep shattering records all career long so that's Derrick Henry and then we were gonna watch his stiff arms which we still can um I mean right here stiff arm get the fuck off me throw him to the ground uh this is the Josh Norman one coming up the di the most disrespectful one we've seen got this man horizontal in the air uh get off me I'm a little upset we didn't see big stiff arms in high school I mean that would have just been disrespectful at that point uh here we go Derrick Henry right up the middle against the Jaguars here we go get out of here <laughs> Get out of here! Just stiff arming the corner, no big deal. And the the other guy that's trying to run him down, and another guy, folks. He stiff armed three straight people out here, three straight Jaguars defenders, all the way for 99 yards to the end zone. I mean, oh my! How can you not think this is the best running back? How does this man not get any more praise? I don't understand it. This man is truly slept on. I know he's highly praised because he's a great running back, but he deserves so much more attention. A la why we have this man behind us on the wall. We will all always respect this man King Henry and we will only refer to him from now on as King Henry because that's the level of respect that he truly deserves oh my god so let's watch this last one right here what is this uh, against the cold stiff arm let me see who is gonna stiff arm right here man I mean folks it's just fantastic I mean one last one here here we go against the Eagles last stiff arm here don't do it to him bless him <laughs> <laughs> shoved him right out of bounds get the fuck off me uh so man oh man and then we've got this little inside uh inside highlight on how he does it hey running backs kids aspiring running backs if you want to be like derrick henry this is the drills you got to do uh your coach trying to punch out the ball while people are diving for your legs this is the drill to run the stiff arm drill you got to dive at his legs and then he pushes you down while the coach is trying to punch out the ball from his uh secure hand so Folks, can we all respect Derrick Henry more, please? I feel like y'all are disrespecting him by not respecting him the way he needs to be respected. Derrick Henry, you're the greatest thing I've ever seen. Everything that I have ever seen in my 25 years of life, I have never seen anything as impressive as Derrick Henry. Not just football related, not just sports related. I'm talking technology related. I'm talking about everything, folks. Derrick Henry is the most impressive thing I have ever seen in my entire life. I love this dude, folks. I absolutely love this dude right here. And I can't wait to see him do it again this year. That's really it. I think we're only going to be watching Titans games from now on, folks. Uh, we will rebrand our channel to Derrick Henry. That is it. Every single day on the show, we will be watching what Derrick Henry has been doing all week long. Um, so get ready for that. Because that's coming tomorrow. Starting tomorrow's show, it's all Derrick Henry. I don't care about the Thursday Night Football game. game. I don't care about Hard Knocks anymore. I don't care about anything else. I care about this dude. Next year's Hard Knocks, it better be the Titans. And they better only be focusing on Derrick Henry. I didn't think I got enough Dak this season in Hard Knocks. Well, whatever... Whatever, how much ever Derrick Henry y'all give me next year in Hard Knocks, it's not going to be enough. So I will be Hard Knocks next year. Next year, I will be following around Derrick Henry 24/7. Hopefully, I can get his permission so I don't get a restraining order. But I will do whatever I will do whatever it takes to get 24 <laughs> 24 hour access to this man. So Derrick Henry, man, oh my God, can't wait to see this dude this year. Derrick, mother loving Henry. Oh, oh, woo! I had to let that out, folks. It was building inside me, watching and seeing what this man is doing in high school and in uh, um, in the NFL, stiff arming these people. Woo! It was just building up. I had to let it out. I'm sorry. Oof.
Ooh, folks. <laughs> Truly, ooh, folks. I love this dude. I love this dude. All right, let's let's get off this topic because I could go for the next 20 minutes before we close out the show just ooing. <laughs> just ooing on Derek Henry. All righty, folks. The time has officially come. Let's get a little ready for week one. Now, how do we get ready for week one? Well, we're going to bet week one. And how do we get ready to bet week one? We have to guess the lines. Now, we did this all last season, and we are going to continue to do it this season. Why do we guess the lines? Because it lets us know what our gauge is. Where is our thinking at relative to Vegas' thinking and how they predict the game is going to go? Now, Vegas, you got to give them credit. They don't lose money. They know they don't lose money. They know. I'm sure they're running simulations. I, I mean, that's why they get the spread so close majority of the time. And when, you know, uh, games are actually at the line, like let's just say this Cowboys Bucks game is Bucks minus three, and then the Bucks win by three. And you're like, how did Vegas do it? You, you know how much technology Vegas has, folks? They're running 10,000 simulations on each game, probably more than 10,000, and seeing what the score is, the outcome, the line, and that's how they bet. They, that's how they make these lines, folks. They've got all the information. They run it through their algorithm. It spits out the line. They know the line. They know what's going to happen. They can basically predict the future based on their line. Do they get it wrong sometimes? Yeah, I mean, you know, because nothing's 100%. So that's why we guess the lines every single week. Is our thinking on par with Vegas's? If it's on, that's great. That means kind of we're on the same same wavelength. Exactly what we've been seeing, Vegas has been th seeing. Exactly what we put a lot of stake into and what we weigh a lot in terms of teams. Vegas is also pretty much doing the same thing. And if we are off, then how do we retool our thinking? Are we right, first of all, or are we wrong? That's something that we try to figure out. And then, you know, when we make our official picks, we resort back to how much we were off and how much we were off by and big offs right on the money. So it does kind of give us a great gauge of just how we are overall when we guess and react to the line, seeing if we were on the money, off the mark, and refine our thinking retool our thinking a little bit. So we are going to continue on doing it this season. We're doing it a little bit earlier. Uh, we usually do it on Thursdays during the NFL season. We're bumping it up uh, a day here for week one. Uh, but, you know, next week it will be Thursday because Wednesdays during the NFL season is our Wednesday film study, our last day to kind of get our final thinkings on what these teams were doing last week to get us ready for this coming week, which, you know, the next day we guess and react to the lines and everything that we saw um, in the footage and the game games and all that the stats all that and then we make our overall predictions on Fridays so with all that being said let's start guessing these lines and then we'll check what the official line is according to DraftKings that's the sports book that we utilize um, that we always go with to see what the lines are we respect their lines we respect their thinking most of the time so here we go let's start guessing these lines so here we go um, also to note home Field advantage is worth three points according to Vegas. So that's always our base, and then we build off of that base. So here we go. Cowboys, Bucks, Thursday night football, Bucks at home. So obviously the Bucks minus three. But with this Cowboys team not having Zach Martin for the most part, the offensive lineman, the defense not being great, this uh, Bucks team bringing back everybody, and everybody is healthy. OJ Howard's healthy. Tom Brady's healthy. Antonio Brown's ready to go right out of the gate. So this Bucks team, they're ready to fire on all cylinders. I think this Cowboys offense is going to, going to be really, really good. This Cowboys defense may be a little lackluster, and I think the team may be a little slow out of the gate. They didn't win a preseason game. You have to coach, kind of chalk that up to some sort of coaching, whatever, whatever coach you want to put it on. Um, if you want to put it on the players, that's fine, but still at the end of the day, coaches, you're not good coaches if you just have great players. You still have to coach up coach up the kind of B tier, the C tier, the second strings, the third strings. You still have to coach them up to be ready and win some preseason games. Uh, so wasn't really impressed with what the Cowboys did in the preseason games. And this Bucks team, 
they've got everybody back. So Bucks minus three just for the home field, but I'm going to bump it all the way up, and I'm going to be a little disrespectful to this Cowboys team, and I don't want to be, but I'm going to go Bucks minus nine and a half. I wish it would be competitive. I wish the uh, the Cowboys could have a chance to win this game, but unfortunately their defense is going to be a big liability out here, and uh, Tom Brady's going to pick it apart. So I'm going Bucks minus nine and a half points. Truly, truly unfortunate. All right, then we get the Jaguars and the Texans. All right, this one's going to be an interesting. Jags at Texans here. Texans with the home field. It's going to be interesting just because it's Tyrod Taylor, a new kind of coach here for this Texans team. How are they handling all the distractions of Deshaun Watson? And then when we look on the other side of the field, we've got the Jaguars, who are starting rookie Trevor Lawrence, who has a rookie head coach in the NFL in Urban Meyer. And then they just had their running back that they were, you know, secured on, big on, who is going to be their number one uh, running back. He's out for the season and all of this so Jaguars on the road with a rookie head coach and a rookie quarterback versus Tyrod Taylor having to kind of face all the distractions of this trash Texans team and uh, you know Deshaun Watson so <clears throat> this one's going to be real close um, I'm going to give it to I, I'm, I'm probably going to just call this one Texans minus three I don't know if any one of these teams has a clear-cut advantage over the other one. I mean, we got rookies um, on the Jaguars versus the just trash ownership of this Texans team. Now, it is potentially going to get better this season because they fired Bill O'Brien, thank goodness, last season, and he was kind of the one that was just ruining the team. But how much does this Deshaun Watson narrative distract from the team and how well are these teams overall we've got these teams kind of being bottom tier bottom five definitely in the league but we're just going to call this one texans minus three we'll see what trevor lawrence can do this week great week for trevor lawrence i mean this is the game you want to start right out of the gate against the texans absolutely all right then we get the chargers in Chargers at Washington. All right, Washington going with Ryan Fitzpatrick, who we know is a serviceable quarterback in this league, a little bit of a gunslinger, and Washington has a really, really great defense. Then when we look at the Chargers, they've got a great team overall. Uh, Justin Herbert is the man. He's going to get it done, and overall, this Chargers de uh, defense is solid. Their running game is solid. Their wide receivers are solid. Their coach has yet to be proven uh, just because they got rid of Anthony Lynn so this is going to be a good game to watch for as well Washington at home I give them minus three because of that but I like the Chargers a little bit more um, <clears throat> so I'm going to call this one Washington minus one and a half still favorites but just because of the home field advantage and I like the Chargers overall so Washington minus one and a half <coughs> All right, then we get the Colts and the Seahawks, and this is going to be a great game as well. Carson Wentz is going to be playing this game. He's not going to be out for week one or any sort of that. So this Colts team is going to be ready to rock right out of the, right, right out of the gate, but T.Y. Hilton, unfortunately, is not going to be playing this game. So their wide receivers is going to take a little bit of a hit, but we know that their running back by committee can truly help offset that big load of moving the ball without having you know your A1 Tier 1 wide receiver and T.Y. Hilton. Then we get Seattle with Russell Wilson and the new offensive coordinator here and the new offensive plan and everybody kind of being on the same page this season. So this uh, and Jamal Adams getting you know his deal done, so he's going to be playing free and loose and all that. So I think these two teams are really kind of equal. Colts at home minus three, and I'm just going to call it that. Uh, very very two great teams out here, two of the better teams <clears throat> in this league overall, and uh, I'm going to call it basically Colts minus three. Just because of the home field advantage, basically equal teams out here. All right, then we get the Jets at the Panthers. All righty, so Sam Donald revenge game. How much does that play into this? Matt Rule, uh, second-year head coach, by ability. You know, I've been hearing that this Panthers team has a really slept-on defense. We'll see if that's true. Then we get the Jets, Zach Wilson, rookie quarterback. We get Corey Davis, though, a great wide receiver that he can trust and have great trust and confidence in. We've also seen Zach Wilson kind of had the best stats of all the rookie quarterbacks um, through the preseason game, so we can kind of, you know, elevate him a little bit. We get Robert Sala. I've kind of been buying into him a little bit slowly as the training camp and preseason games have progressed, and now it's all going to come to light 
week one when he has to actually coach. Unfortunately, I just don't think it all comes together for this Jets team. Christian McCaffrey's back, um, so he's going to be kind of playing real loosey-goosey out there. First game back, ready to explode, ready to ready to kind of light it up, uh, continuing on you know his overall career, which has been great. 2019 season, which was great. 2020, obviously got injured, so he's ready to resume here. So um, I, I want to believe in the Jets this season. I just don't know if I can do it week one on the road. So we're going to go Panthers- Minus five here. Could be a little bit better, but I'm gonna give uh, I'm gonna give the Jets some respect by not increasing the line. I could see it minus six and a half. Um, I'm gonna say that um, we're gonna write that down. I, I think Vegas is gonna do it minus six and a half, uh, but ours ours is gonna be minus five. I think that's a little bit more fair, a little bit more respectful. All right, then we get the Vikings at the Bengals, and um, yeah, I, I, I don't buy this Bengals team at all, unfortunately. Jamar Chase, he can say whatever he wants, but until he proves he can catch the ball, I, I'm going to assume he can't. <laughs> How crazy is that? We have to assume a wide receiver can't catch the ball. Uh, this Vikings defense is ready to rock and show what it has been doing. I know Mike Zimmer is really going to put a lot of emphasis and focus on the defense this season and making sure it's airtight great. Um, and then the offense, it should be real solid, definitely against this Bengals team, which I don't really think has a great defense or a great offense. I don't really know what the uh, overall identity of this Bengals team is going to be. So, um, Bengals at home, minus three, but the Vikings are so much better. We really have to flip this around to really kind of Vikings, uh, Vikings minus four and a half. Um, yes, you've heard that right. That's a seven-point swing. So, if this was kind of Vikings at home, the, the spread would theoretically be kind of... Vikings minus like 10 and a half, 11 if not. And yeah, I would kind of say that. So I'm taking the Vikings minus four and a half here. I don't think the Bengals are going to be that competitive this season overall. And I don't think it's going to happen week one. So I don't think it's going to happen if they're not, if they are competitive, I don't think it happens week one. So I got the Vikings here. I think this is a total mismatch and uh, they're out to a roaring start. All right, Cardinals at Titans. Two real solid, great teams here. Titans, new offensive coordinator this season. I don't think we're going to have any issues with it. I think this Titans offense is going to get it done exactly as it has the last two seasons, if not better. We liked what we saw from the offensive coordinator in training camp, putting up all the points. We loved it. Um, all right, and then the Cardinals, they got, you know, J.J. Watt defensively. They shore up their offense with A.J. Brown. So two elite offenses going at it. Good quarterbacks. I like Kyler Murray a little bit better than Ryan Tannehill, but Ryan Tannehill is still very, very good and serviceable, proven he can win games. Running backs, obviously Derrick Henry's taking the cake and the pie and all the sweets off the counter. Uh, wide receivers, two great ones on both teams, A.J. Brown and Julio Jones for the Titans, DeAndre Hopkins, A.J. Green for the Cardinals. So overall, two really great teams right here. So the spread is going to be real close. We're just going to call it Titans minus minus three and a half. I'm going to give them a little bit of a bump here. Overall, a better team overall because of Derrick Henry, and uh, we'll call it Titans minus three and a half. All right, then we get the 49ers at the Lions. All righty, Lions are absolutely trash. 49ers are starting Jimmy Garoppolo. Don't be shocked if you see Trey Lance out there. We saw kind of quarterback by committee. We've never seen it in the league, but it worked out for preseason game number three. Now, does that mean it's going to work out for the regular season? Absolutely not, but it could. It could work. Um, so we're, we're going to put a lot of stake into that, and I think it does pay off this season. Overall, the Lions... Dan Campbell, no buyability into, 0% buyability. Jared Goff, we'll, we'll slowly buy him. We'll start at maybe 20% buyability into Jared Goff, having to kind of earn that buyability as the season progresses. But this Lions team is nothing, folks. Offensively, nothing. Defensively, nothing. They're at home, which is the best thing for the Lions here. But the 49ers, their defense is ready to rock. They've been bad last season because of the injuries. They're ready to prove that they're one of the best teams in the league again. Kyle Shanahan's ready to get back to the Super Bowl. This is going to be a slaughter. I'm sorry. Sorry. And this is going to be a disrespectful spread here, uh, but I'm sorry. Uh, 49ers minus 13 and a half points. Yes, a 16 point swing. Um, I don't care. Uh, this would be 49ers minus 16 and a half at home, probably more around minus 20. I don't care. I don't think this Lions team does anything. 49ers minus 13 and a half points. All right, then we get. The Steelers at the Bills, and man, oh man, this one's real tough. This is 
these are two real great teams in the AFC, top tier teams in the AFC. Big Ben, fresh week one, ready to rock. Najee Harris, week one, ready to rock. Josh Allen, week one, coming off of the best season, uh, the most surprising season I've ever seen in NFL history, ready to rock week one. So these are two great teams, and I'm going to respect them both by just calling it Bills minus three, and that's only because they are at home, folks. This one's going to be real great to watch. Probably don't bet it because I really don't know what the hell is going to happen in this game because these are two great teams. They probably lose close, um, so I would probably stay away from the spread um, unless there's great value, like a Steelers plus seven, which, of course, I would swallow, but I don't think that happens. I would gobble that minus uh, plus seven up for the Steelers, absolutely. All right, uh, next game up, we got the Eagles and the Falcons. Eagles at Falcons here. All righty, this is going to be real interesting because both these teams have the potential to be good, have the potential to be bad, and we haven't really seen what the heck is going to happen with this team in the preseason. So two question marks on this team. I would highly advise to stay away from unless there's some great value, which I don't know there that there is going to be. So two new head coaches for both of these teams. Jalen Hurts going into his first full official year. Didn't play that many games last season got out kind of um, to a decent start but it was at the end of the season when everybody had their feet underneath them they bring in Devontae Smith I'm sure he's going to be great Falcons, Calvin Ridley is ready to kind of, you know, take that role from number two wide receiver to number one. We've got no problems with him doing that. Uh, Matt Ryan should be solid here. The running game for the Falcons, Kyle Pitts, his first look. Now the Falcons are at home, which I do have confidence in. Um, so I'm going to call this one Falcons minus four and a half. Uh, but I, I don't know what I get with this Eagles team. It's true question marks here. I really don't know if they're going to be good or not. We'll know week one. I would probably stay away from this game, though. Falcons minus four and a half. All right, then we get the Chiefs and the Browns. Chiefs at home here. So the Chiefs minus three, but I'm going to respect the Browns here. I really love what this Browns team is going to do this season. I really think they can be absolutely great. Uh, Kevin Zafanski's year two under Baker Mayfield. Um, you know, they're going to get it done. They know how to work with each other. They know what to call to have Baker Mayfield be successful. So I'm going to call this one Chiefs minus four. Chiefs minus four. I can't. I can't give a little extra credit to Patrick Mahomes. I can't not not do that, folks. So I can't not do that. So that's the only th reason why I'm giving the Chiefs an extra kind of point on their total uh, for Chiefs minus four. But it's still big respect to this Browns team. I mean, if we're talking about the Browns from like 2018, 2019, this is uh, Chiefs minus ten. But because of last season and how well it was, it's only Chiefs minus four. So they're getting there, and this is still winnable game for the Browns. Chief, uh, Browns plus four. Is not bad value overall if that's what we can truly get. That's a potential there to, for one of our picks come Friday. All right, then we get the Packers at the Saints. All righty, well, um, the Sa oh, it's not even at the Saints because it's uh, Hurricane Ida. We forgot. So no home field advantage here, neutral field. So 0-0, zero, 0-0 zero, zero, zero spread. Nobody's got the, the minus 3, plus 3 advantage edge for the home field advantage. So Packers, they're ready to rock. I know Aaron Rodgers is ready to rock. He's got all of his cast of characters that he wants on this team. Great relationship, working with the general manager, uh, you know, him and um, the head coach. Matt LaFleur, great relationship. They're ready to rock. Um, they're ready to put this entire offseason mess behind them. But the Saints team, they star James Winston, who we do believe in, but week one isn't going to be there. No Michael Thomas. Not having your A1 tier one wide receiver, and the receiver depth has kind of was not as good this season as it was last season because they lose Emmanuel Sanders. Um, also, they don't have Michael Thomas, like we said. Now they have Alvin Kamara, but they don't have Latavius Murray. So they just got rid of a running back, and that kind of maybe messes with the mentality, uh, the mental aspect of the players. They're like, damn, they just cut Latavius Murray, who we really thought was going to be here on our team, and we liked him and all that, but then they just cut him. And now they're bringing in these new corners uh, that we don't don't really know if they're going to pan out well. We think they could be solid in this league, but you know the corners here are a big problem for the Saints. And what does the corner shut down? The pass catchers for the Packers. So I think this one isn't going to be as close as people think. And I'm going to call this one Packers minus five and a half points. I, I think the Saints get off to a slow start. I want to believe in Jameis, and I really hope he has a great season this year. But overall, the team of the Saints, I think it kind of comes crumbling down a little bit. 
All right, next game up is the Broncos at the Giants, and this is going to be a great one. I want to see what Teddy Bridgewater can do for this Broncos team. I want to see what Daniel Jones does year three leap here, and I want to see Saquon Barkley out, out on the field. I don't think uh, Saquon Barkley has kind of been officially na uh, named yet. Um, we're going to assume he's playing, though. We are assuming he is playing. Um, so Giants at home, the minus three there. But um, we just heard from Kenny Galladay say that the Giants are going to get off to a slow start this season. That doesn't leave a good taste in our mouth if your players are actively saying, hey, we're going to get off to a slow start. I can't buy into that. So Giants minus three because of home field. But I'm going to give it to the Broncos for just being a better team overall. And I think they can get out to a hotter start than this Giants team can since nobody's really believing in themselves here with the Giants. Saquon Barkley's not even named. We're like five days away. Um, Kenny Galladay saying we're getting out to a slow start. And Daniel Jones, no hype videos about him all offseason and preseason games. So what the hell is going on? Is there no believability in this Giants offense? Because I was big on this Giants team at the start of the offseason. And now here we are. All of our faith has fizzled out. So I'm going to call this one Broncos. Ah. I'm actually call, calling it a pick em game. I'm, I'm going to call this spread a pick em. Pick em. Pick em game. Yep. Pick em. Pick em. We're going to call pick em. <laughs> All right, next game up. Three more left. Here we go. Dolphins at Patriots. Well, I'm not really buying this Patriots offense. I saw Mac Jones in the preseason, and I liked it, but we know preseason and regular season are two different animals, and this Dolphins defense is not going to play around. They are going to throw the kitchen sink, everything, everything and the kitchen sink, all of it, and the bathroom sink, all the sinks in your house. You got a basement sink? All three sinks are coming at Mac Jones this week uh, defensively. Um, I uh, The Patriots defense, we'll see how it goes. Stephon Gilmore is not going to be playing. Tua, we are big believers in. And I might be a little disrespectful here uh, to this Patriots team, but I'm going to call this one Dolphins minus 3.5. That's a 6.5 uh, point swing, folks. Because, uh, you know, Dolphins are on the, on the road. So, Dolphins minus 3.5. Then we get the Bears at the Rams. And uh, Matt Nagy, you made this bad. You made this spread by starting Andy Dalton, so I'm going to disrespect the hell out of you. I'm going to call this one Rams at home. Rams minus eight and a half. Yep, I'm going disrespectful with the spread, folks. If you want to start Andy Dalton and give your team no chance to win this game, okay, uh, it's going to reflect in the spread. Rams minus eight and a half. Blow up by the Rams. Defensively, offensively, Bears can't do anything. Andy Dalton can't do nothing. And uh, Rams minus eight and a half. And then the last game of the weekend, or the week, Ravens, Raiders on Monday Night Football, Raiders at home. Now the Ravens, with all this running back controversy going on of everybody getting injured and having bringing in Le'Veon Bell and maybe doesn't go week one for the Ravens. Potential not great start out here for the Ravens. Raiders have a high explosive offense. The Ravens have a great defense. Ravens, their offense, hopefully it's good. Raiders' defense isn't that great. Should be a really decently close one, but I'm going to call this one Raiders... Minus four and a half. Raiders minus three because of home field advantage. And I'm taking out another point and a half because of the Ravens kind of running game. It's not going to be there week one. So um, they're probably going to rely on Lamar Jackson. Maybe they do a little bit too much. And I think the Raiders defense has an opportunity to take advantage. Um, Ravens plus four and a half, though, wouldn't be a bad bet, though, in my opinion. Uh, so we'll see what these spreads are. So now that we've got them all guessed, all predicted, let's see how close we were on the money. Were we off on? any did we get them all right i'm sure we did uh so let's double check here with the official week one spreads were we on the money where did we miss how bad were we missing or were we right on the money on every single one of them so here we go let's get these lines all the way up to date here we are not going to be making our official picks just quite yet. We are just going to be talking through the lines here. So let's see what we get. Lines are all the way up to date, folks. How great is this? Let's get these off. I don't want these on there anymore. A little distracting. Our over and under bets. But here we go. All righty. Here we go. Game one. Cowboys, Bucks, Thursday Night Football. We predicted the line at Bucks minus nine and a half, and it's Bucks minus eight and a half. So exactly what our thinking was. It's going to be a little bit of a blowout here. Now, the Cowboys plus eight and a half isn't a bad take just because, you know, usually games aren't more than one position, one possession. Um, you know, Bucks could also be getting out to a slow start. I know we've been ranting and raving about this Bucks team, but they still, this is still their first game too. Uh, Cowboys. We'll see how they do it, but right on the money there with our spread. Unfortunately, just a point off. 
Um, but uh, yeah, Bucks minus eight and a half, right? Kind of on the money with our thinking. All right, next game up is the Jets and the Panthers. We predicted this line at ba Panthers minus five. We thought the spread Vegas is going to put out is Panthers minus six and a half. The actual spread is Panthers minus five and a half. So we basically just uh, sandwiched it in right on the money there. Panthers minus five. Panthers minus five and a half. Um, I think I, I just think the Jets get out to a slow start, and it's no fault of their own. It's just rookie head coach, rookie quarterback on the road week one. It's not recipe for success. It's unfortunate. But uh, Panthers minus five and a half, right on money, right on par with our thinking. Perfect. All right, next spread up is the Steelers and the Bills, and we predicted this line at Bills minus three, and and it's uh, wow, 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 wow. Okay, our first big shocker of the year, I guess. Bills minus six and a half. Wow, that's big. I think I love the Steelers plus those points. I really think this is going to be a dogfight. Josh Allen is expecting a dogfight. Why are we getting out to a... Why is this spread so big for two great teams? Wow, Vegas a little disrespectful with the Steelers. Why? What is the 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 hesitation on saying the Steelers are going to be a good team? Is it Big Ben? Is it Najee Harris? Is it the offensive line? What is it? Is it the defense? Interesting. So Bills minus six and a half, a lot to swallow there for against great teams week one. I don't know if I want to swallow that many points week one. We don't know what the hell is going to happen. I mean, we're all just analyzing and predicting right now for, you know, throughout this entire offseason. Nobody truly knows what's going to happen. There's always a little bit of a surprise every single year. Is Josh Allen the surprise of taking a step back? Jeez, Bills minus six and a half. Crazy. Wow. That gives it. That's interesting. I think I love taking the. Steelers plus six and a half week one. We make our picks on Friday, folks. We'll sleep on these ones for two days, but Steelers plus six. It's kind of early calling me. I'm not going to lie. Jeez. All right. Great value. That's great value. Steelers plus six is great value. Bills minus six I don't think is great value at all. At all. I think this is a dogfight. One point game, two point game, three point game. Vegas has it being a seven point game, which I understand. Last one to score a touchdown wins. I get it. They're playing the game there. They're playing the number game. That's unfortunate. <laughs> Jeez. Uh, but the good thing is you you bump that up to Steelers plus seven. You don't lose that much value. So that's not bad. I think I would buy the extra half a point. <laughs> I think I'd buy the extra half a point. Steelers plus seven. That's great value. Oof. I think I love it. All righty. Let's move on to the next game up here. 49ers and the Lions. And we disrespected this uh, Lions team with our spread. We called this one 49ers minus 17 and a half. And wow, this is great value. 49ers minus seven and a half. I take that all day. I, I'm not believing in the Lions week one. Um, you know, if they show out and, you know, sh show good signs, I'll buy them week two. But Dan Campbell week one, I don't care that they're at home. Uh, that's a low spread to me. I think I swallowed the seven and a half there by the 49ers. There's no chance those Lions win. I've got no problem saying that. There's no chance the Lions win week one. I swallowed the seven and a half probably. All right, next game up here is the Jaguars and the Texans. We predicted this game at Texans minus three, and it's, wow, Texans plus three. Disrespect here by Vegas, I think. I'm not buying into this Jaguars team week one. I'll buy into Trevor Lawrence, but I'm not buying into Urban Meyer, and he's the one that's putting this entire offense and defense roster together. So I don't think this Jaguars team is going to be able to get out to this hot start. I think a thing that people are sleeping on is the Texans are actually handling this, this, this Deshaun Watson situation kind of really solidly I don't think this has any distractions to the main roster here and to this main team they all know Deshaun Watson's not going to be here they know that they they haven't been making it a big story we've talked about Deshaun Watson what maybe a handful of times this offseason but it's not like an everyday story uh they've told everybody flat out, hey, we're trying to trade him. This is what we want. He's not playing for us. He will be sitting. He's on our roster right now, but he like it's not like the team is focusing on Deshaun Watson. It's not like Deshaun Watson may play, may not play, may play, not, not may not play. It's he he's not playing. It's Tyrod Taylor's team. So Texans plus three here is real interesting value. And I, I think it's a little disrespectful for uh, the Vegas to uh, assume the Jaguars are going to be good right out of the gate like this. I think there's some great value with the Texans plus some points here. On the road, week one, I don't think Urban Meyer has his team ready to rock. So, all right. Texans plus three, interesting. 
All right, next game up is the Seahawks in the Colts. We predicted this line at... Colts minus three, and it's Colts plus two and a half. Wow, once again, another kind of flip of the spread. With Texans being the home field, they start at minus three, but they go to plus three, a whole a whole turnaround. And same thing here with the Colts. We had it at Colts minus three because they were the home field, and now it's Colts plus two and a half here. So small spread because both of these teams are really, really good. We'll see how great these teams start out week one. i probably stay away from this game just because it's two great teams. Not a lot of great value here either way. I mean, you know, usually games are going to be won by probably three points uh, just because of how scoring works in the NFL. And, uh, you know, two and a half, not really great value either way you slice it. So, interesting. Next game up is the Cardinals and the Titans. We predicted this line at Titans minus three and a half, and it's Titans minus three. So we gave, uh, you know, the Titans a little bit of an extra point, uh, half a point there because of Derrick Henry. Vegas doesn't do that. That's fine. Right on par with our thinking. So uh, exactly how we thought it would be. Chargers at Washington. We predicted this line at Washington minus one and a half, and it's Washington plus one and a half. So Vegas very, very heavily favoring the Chargers, and we'll see how uh, Ryan Fitzpatrick handles this offense because we know he's a true gunslinger. He's going to let it fly. He knows this is potentially his last season starting or even playing in this league, uh, so he's going to be ready to go week one all the way to week 17, hopefully a, maybe a playoff game or whatever it is, and we'll see how Justin Herbert uh, kind of comes off of his first official training camp no training camp last season because of COVID so we'll see if that helped him out or maybe kind of was like hey this is new am I doing it right am I doing good what's going on didn't play in the preseason either so we'll see how that's looking but it's Washington plus one all right, then the next game up is the Vikings at the Bengals. We predicted this line at Vikings minus four and a half, and it's Vikings minus three and a half. So exactly on our thinking, the Vegas went, you know, Bengals minus three for being home to Bengals plus three and a half. So a complete turnaround there, exactly how we thought it would be. Once again, I just can't buy this Bengals team week one, but I do like that Vikings team. Only have to swallow three and a half too. I think that we like it. All right, next game up is the Eagles at the Falcons. We predicted this line at Falcons minus four and a half, and it's just Falcons minus three because of the home field. We bumped it up a little bit because we can believe in Matt Ryan. We believe in Calvin Ridley. Uh, the running game, though, question marks, and it's still question marks on the Eagles. It's Miles Sanders who's solid, uh, and we'll see how he works out this season, but Falcons minus three because of the home field, that's what the spread is. All right, we get uh, Dolphins at the Patriots, and this spread we predicted uh, Dolphins minus three and a half, and wow, 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 it's Dolphins plus three and a half. Patriots minus three just because of the home field, so I think this could potentially be the best value of the week. Dolphins, they are on the road, I get it, but it's Dolphins plus points with the Patriots starting a rookie quarterback? You don't think this Dolphins defense is going to be able to kind of hinder his success this week? Come on, I don't know about that. I think I'm loving the Dolphins plus three. Next game up is the Browns at the Chiefs. We predicted this line at Chiefs minus four and it's Chiefs minus six. Wow. All righty. Now we kept this spread a little low because we wanted to show respect for the Browns and Baker Mayfield and all that. But now Vegas, now showing that same kind of respect, kind of gives us some decent value with the Browns plus six right there. That's definitely going to be interesting and very, very tempting. It's something that we should kind of take a take a definite heavy look into. We'll see if we take this Browns plus a six. I think that's some real great value there with a serviceable, good offensive and defensive team overall. Patrick Mahomes got, you know, got knocked off his mark in the Super Bowl because of the edge rushers. The Browns bring in Jadavian Clowney. They already have Miles Garrett. They're ready to rock week one. Plus six. Whew. That's interesting. All right, a couple more games to go over. Four more games, so let's power through. Here we go. Packers at the Saints. We predicted this line at... Packers minus five and a half, and it's Packers minus three and a half. So once again, Vegas is on the same page as us. We just went a little bit above what Vegas was thinking. So, um, you know, no home field advantage here. Unfortunate for, you know, the Saints, <laughs> not for the Packers. They love it. Uh, but, yeah, I mean, the Saints are just not that great on neutral field compared to this Packers team with the corner situation playing out, cutting uh, Latavius Murray I don't think was the right option, no more Drew Brees. We believe in Jameis Winston, but all of that, I think we have to go on what is certain here, and that is Aaron Rodgers being great. So Packers minus 3.5, not bad right there. Some decent value. 
Don't have to swallow that many points for the Packers. That's not bad. All right, next game up is the Broncos at the Giants. We predicted this line at a pick -em in yeah, Vegas doesn't see it that way. They see it a complete flip at Giants plus three, Broncos minus three. And yeah, I kind of agree. Uh, Vegas kind of took it and ran with it. We played it kind of uh, safely at just the pick em because we uh, only kind of count that as a three-point turnaround, not a six-point turnaround like Vegas does. So, Giants plus three out here. They're getting out to a slow start. I would heavily stay away from the Giants. If their players aren't buying into this team, I'm not going to buy into them either. So, I don't even know what the hell I want to do for this Broncos-Giants game. I'd probably stay away from it because it's big question marks everywhere. We believe in Teddy Bridgewater, but he still has to go out there and show it. And same thing with the, with the Giants. We believe in Daniel Jones in this offense, but we have to see it because we haven't seen it. So, uh, that's a tough one. we probably stay away from it. Final two games. Here we go. Bears at the Rams. We predicted this line at Rams minus 8.5, and, and it is Rams minus 7.5. So exactly on our thinking, Rams blows out the Bears. Andy Dalton gives them no chance, and the Rams defense absolutely shuts out the Bears. So right on thinking with Vegas. And then the last game of the week, the Monday night football game, Ravens at Raiders. We predicted this one at Raiders minus 4.5, and, and we are totally wrong on this one. They go Ravens minus 4. All righty. Maybe Vegas isn't putting putting that much stake into their running back game. Alrighty, that's fine. Um, I think it's going to be a little bit of a hindrance here. Um, not just because the team's not good and we can't believe into Lamar Jackson, but now the Raiders' defense, they really only have to play the running game. or the They only really have to play the passing game. And the passing game wasn't really there last season, uh, the deep ball at least. So, you know, we have to see the Ravens go out and do it. We believe in Lamar Jackson, but the Raiders at home, week one, all of that. Um... This Ravens defense is good, which could stifle the Raiders offense, and the Raiders offense is definitely the best thing about this Raiders team. We'll see how the Raiders defense does, but yeah, Vegas giving them plus four points. Wow, that was the one that we were definitely totally wrong on, definitely. Alrighty, so Vegas is believing in Lamar Jackson to get it done himself. Monday Night Football, on the road, no running support. You know, your wide receivers aren't the healthiest at the moment. No, um, no rookie, Rashad Bateman, right? No, no go for week one? So, all righty. If you want to give the Ravens minus four, that's fine. I don't know if I necessarily agree, though. Alrighty, that is going to do it for us today, folks. We went absolutely late, so we just are going to get out of here. No breaking news, nothing like that. We are out of here. We are done. We are back tomorrow, live noon Eastern, and we'll go a little bit more in depth into that Cowboys Bucks game and make our official pick on the spread. And uh, have a good one because, uh, you know, last sleep before football. So, enjoy it.